Hello, and welcome to another slightly late, fully live episode of Hacking with Friends, where we go over the hacking news and tools of the week. Today, my guest, as usual, is Killian. Killian, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me yet again. Appreciate it. Looking forward to the uh, conversation. Definitely. Yeah, there's tons to cover today. And um, yeah, sorry for the late start, everyone. I had to tear apart my studio and also restream. The service we use has completely reconfigured itself. So getting to know it <laughs> all over again has been a fun experience. Uh, just want to give a shout out also to everybody in our lovely Discord server who uh, reaches out to double check whether or not we're doing the stream anytime we're late. Yes, uh, if you want to stay a part of the conversation or if you want to be able to get in touch with us to determine whether or not it's worth waiting around, make sure to check out the Discord server at nugget.lol. And uh, yeah, I've had a pretty busy week in preparation for my cyber camp coming up. Uh, I mentioned it a couple times before, but the state of Montana is having a series of cyber camps that are supposed to educate kids about cybersecurity and kind of get them excited. I got selected to do one of them. So I'm going to be hosting a week long cyber camp starting next week. And that means I'm not going to be on the air. I. Uh, I think for, yeah, uh, Wednesday and Friday. So this will be the last security forward, at least for, you know, the, the next week or so. And then it will be back the week after that. But a lot of people have asked, uh, you know, can I join this cyber camp? Well, yes. If you are a child that lives in Northwest Montana, you may absolutely join the cyber camp. <laughs> and there's going to be some fun things like this Meow Mixer board, uh, which our other guest, Angelina, actually designed which these kids are going to be putting together, soldering and uh, doing all sorts of cool stuff with. So yeah, lots of fun, and, but try not to miss me too much because I will not be in for next week. <laughs> all right, so hello to everybody in the chat as well. Good to see James uh, again. Andre, Bat oh wow, Batman's in the chat. That's exciting. <laughs> uh, and before anybody asks, yes, this is live. I will tell you that again as soon as, uh, as, soon as you ask me. Okay, cool. Uh, so we've got lots of news to cover. One thing I just wanted to uh, mention that I noticed, I don't know if anybody was um, anybody else was talking about this, but um, Killian, did you notice that like chat GPT um, will not connect to Bing anymore? No, I didn't notice. I've been just messing around with the built-in Bing, whatever it is, generative stuff. I don't know what their backend is. Um, I have not tried it specifically with uh, chat GPT. Yeah. So, um, Obviously, like Microsoft Edge has had uh, the ability to access the new Bing, which is of <laughs> course, just like, you know, Bing right. and ChatGPT combined. So like ChatGPT formats a Bing request, it runs a search, and based on the data it gets back, it, it will give you an answer. Now, it's kind of like brief. Like it feels like it's been told you told to like only give you like five minutes of its time, mm -hmm. um, whereas like ChatGPT is like free to spend lots of time on some of these answers that are quite elaborate and require more processing. So I've always found like Bing to be a little um lacking sometimes in the follow through like if i ask mm -hmm. it to do like a complicated task so as a yeah. result chat gpt with plugins enabled has been a way for people to be able to you know like access current information because of course the biggest restriction when it comes to um to the ability to use chat gpt is its language or learning cutoff date where it stopped learning around what like like 2021 so like anything that's mm -hmm. happened since then it has no idea about that's going to be products like events like anything that happened it's not going to know about and for me that's a big problem because i'm often asking about microcontrollers that have come out right. since then or specs that have been updated so yeah um for a while it was possible to do this and now it seems as though they have officially disabled this plugin so they're being a little mysterious about this um i'm not super sure exactly like why they've disabled it but this is what mm -hmm. they say um we have learned that ChatGPT browse beta can occasionally display content in ways we don't want. Very <laughs> big. For example, if a user specifically asks for a URL's full text, it might inadvertently fulfill this request. Like hmm. that, that seems like what it should do, right? Like, you know, you right. ask for a URL's full text and then it, it, it prints it out. Um, it really mm. doesn't go into much further detail. So like, I'm like, as like, you know, a press person also, like I'm like yeah. digging for the story here. I'm like, this is some really like, you know, software. This is like almost encryption yeah. event style wording in terms of being uh, like opaque about what's going on. So apparently chat GPT uh, with Bing did something bad that they didn't like, uh, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, that they didn't, don't want. And they disabled the browse with, uh, with uh, Bing feature out of an abundance of caution while we fix this in order to do right by content owners. I think so uh, I think James has it nailed down. Paywall bypass. That was my first thought reading this. Okay. Yeah. That uh, that makes a lot of sense. Like when when you have, for example, like 
uh, oh, it could accidentally show all of the content from the website. And then we mm. mentioned content owners. It yeah. Seems like maybe, yeah, um, paywall bypass is really what it's talking about. And being able to use its like user agent or whatever else to access stuff that would typically require a subscription. Mm -hmm. I think that that's super. OK, so we've basically reverse engineered this. I noticed last <laughs> that, this was, that this was disabled and it very much annoyed me because I needed it for some of the cyber camp I was doing. I wanted to mm -hmm. come up with like a, an OSINT challenge, like based on like data around the Internet. And I was like, hey, robot, go find me data around the Internet. I don't want to waste my time, you know, like rolling <laughs> around trying to find like weird data like you do it. And it was like, no. So <laughs> it seems as though then uh, Bing was able to bypass paywalls and people were starting to use it for that. And now they've just shut shut down the whole thing after getting complaints from the copyright owners. Right. So uh, I guess mystery solved. Thanks. Thanks. Live chat. That was a pretty short <laughs> turnaround. <laughs> Uh, so that's super funny. Um, okay, so that was my my first piece of news. Just because like it was breaking in that I noticed yeah. it, it was uh, disabled last night. But oh, actually, I guess that they disabled it as of July third. So right before uh, right before the fourth of July. Mm -hmm. um, still very very strange. Um, and as you can see, I I did not think that this answered my question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So next up, uh, Threads has come out. Um, Killian. Uh, have you have you made a, a Threads profile yet? No, I'm I'm not the social media person. I'm the wrong person to ask about that. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the most fitting um, meme I've seen about Threads is like a scene from Aqua Teen Hunger Force where Master Shake is just yelling, "I am thirty or forty, and I don't need this." And that's about <laughs> how, I, how I feel about getting a new social media uh, yeah. platform right now. I I have been on Twitter for a while, one might say, and I think I. How many followers do I have on Twitter at this point? I forget sometimes. Um, I have almost 25,000 followers on Twitter. Like I'm obviously like up in this platform and I have seen serious signs of decline. So I've been looking for like Mastodon to pull ahead or like mm -hmm. any of these other great services because I don't even have a Facebook profile. I have a legacy Instagram profile that like, you know, I don't actually use for everything. It's private. It, it, it's like not, it's only got a couple hundred followers. Right. Uh, but I, I don't like how much information meta aka facebook right. uh collects like I, I find it to be a little a little much for me and i really don't mm -hmm. need them building a profile on me and selling it to advertisers i know that's their business at this point i'm right. not 19 anymore so like I, I haven't been super excited to jump into this field well there's another reason why you might want to hesitate if you decide that you don't want to have a threads profile anymore you um have to de delete your instagram profile so if you like, so for, so for example, I've been using my Instagram profile for a long time and I don't really use it that much anymore, but if I was curious about threads and I linked it back to this old Instagram profile, I'd begrudgedly maintain, I would need to delete it in, in order to <laughs> get rid of my threads account. Otherwise I'm going to have an account no matter if I want to right. or not. So there have been also some people talking about the amount of data that Threads collects. And obviously, this is a, a big deal for a company that has been known to hoover up personal data and then sell it to the highest bidder. Um, you know, after the whole Cambridge Analytica thing, like mm -hmm. I'm really sensitive about the kind of information I share with Facebook, passive or not, I really don't like them knowing what I'm up to. So thinking about having like an evil Instagram clone that basically just wants to get all, all up in my business, right. um, you know, looking at the permissions that Threads request, it really is a lot of, uh, of data that they are requesting. And of course, that's no surprise being that it's meta. So um, that is all to say, Based on the fact that I would need to delete my Instagram profile and I would also be giving up tons of data, I have not currently signed up for threads. But if any of you had uh, have done so, I'm curious to know what you think. I just I think that like the the advantage here is like the ease of sign up. It's like you already have a Facebook or Instagram account. So it's probably pretty easy to just get right started with having a threads account. It just doesn't seem cool, you guys. I don't know. I just like all the posts I see from there just seem like a brand a brand Disneyland experience where it's like saccharine and fake and weird. And like Twitter has always been like strange, you know, and like I kind of enjoy that about Twitter. So we'll see how it goes. Right. But overall, um, it's uh, interesting to see the launch of this major Twitter competitor. I also hear that Elon Musk is attempting to sue Meta. Uh, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Like that's the only thing I knew about, about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, um, wow. I, 
I'm still waiting to see how this all plays out. I know a lot of people have signed up for Threads. I'm honestly kind of ha kind of happy that something has come along to challenge um, Twitter or at least make it stop acting so crazy. But um, I'm I'm not super bought in to the thought that Threads is going to be the the thing that emerges and like mm -hmm. um, fixes this whole quandary. So, yeah, we'll see. We will see. Um, Here's a question from the audience, um, which I have no idea, so I won't be able to answer it. But will there be any zero days for JS login bypass for the Threads platform? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's all up to you to make it, buddy. I guess. Probably. I don't know. <laughs> I guess if we knew that, we could make a lot of money on the you know dark web selling that information. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I think last week we talked about how um, Google is getting pretty serious about potentially blocking people using ad blockers on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, also it looks like our our chat overlay has stopped working. So I guess I'll just close it. That's sad. I can still see your chat <laughs> though. So that's uh, just Restream's wonderful update. Um, so a couple users have been reporting that Google is now uh, Google Chrome is now telling you that. Um, like uBlock Origin and other extensions that allow you to bypass ads on, I don't know, services like YouTube are slowing down and should be removed from Chrome. So I don't know if this is directly in relation to that scheme we were talking about last week where mm -hmm. YouTube is starting to block people from being able to watch videos if they're using an ad blocker. But it's certainly funny that the parent company is now advising <laughs> people uninstall one of the tools right. that is being used to get around these sorts of ads. <laughs> All right, some more Twitter stuff. Um, I mentioned last week that I have been purchasing Raspberry Pis. I kind of held out for a long time because they were so expensive. And then recently I've been seeing these like $60 Raspberry Pi 3B pluses pop up on e uh, like Amazon, like other places. So I was interested because I have never seen this revision before. Like I have multiple Raspberry Pi 3B pluses. Um, they, they usually work pretty well. And what I like about them is you can put the wireless network uh, the built-in wireless card into monitor mode, which means you can do like signals intelligence and deauthentication mm -hmm. and all this other cool stuff. So I really like the the chipset and the overall build of the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus, although it is a bit slow because it has like, you know, a gigabyte of, of memory or whatever. But I was noticing that this one also seems to get pretty hot. Um, so I, I want to thank uh, Jargon, yes. Um, for kind of like showing me what this specific model is. So this is apparently the final revision of the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus, and it does have thermal issues. And what's interesting mm. about it also is that when it gets above a certain temperature, I think it's like 70 degrees Celsius, it starts throttling super hard. And yeah. in my thermal imaging test, this little chip right here does in fact get super hot. So a lot of people were mentioning that um, the Raspberry Pi 4 is now available for like, you know, like 10, $15 more. And you might want to get that. And I probably should have, honestly. Uh, but the fact you can't put the onboard card into monitor mode and the fact it takes that stupid HDMI mini standard instead of just a regular HDMI really kind of turned me off to the Raspberry Pi, at least for the workshop I'm working on. So if you are a, a Raspberry Pi hunter, uh, just be wary of this particular version of the Raspberry Pi. It does work, but it tends to get really slow. I've ordered a bunch of heat sinks for this thing, yeah. and hopefully it'll work out. But I just want to give a shout out to our audience for like informing me that I did not get scammed. I <laughs> just got a revision of the Raspberry Pi that, quote, has thermal issues. Oh, sorry, heat issues. So uh, yeah, um, not all is lost. Uh, you can still get a Raspberry Pi for a lot more affordably than you've been able to for quite some time. So if you are somebody who's been holding off on a Raspberry Pi based project, now might be the time to get into it. It seems like uh, some of the supply issues have been fixed. Just be careful about what model you buy. Uh, okay, this is something that's been going around Twitter and I just wanted to shout this out. Uh, so <laughs> if you have been um, in San Francisco, um, you have probably noticed that there are these automated Waymo cars um, driving around and doing, you know, automated pickup and drop off. The interesting thing is they've also been like getting in the way of emergency vehicles. I saw mm -hmm. a video of a fire truck that was impeded by it. I've seen also documented stories of uh, it like running away from police after they pull it over. Um, <laughs> so these things have been really chaotic. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people are kind of sick of them. Personally, like driving through San Francisco, I made sure to like shame anybody like riding in the back of them just because I, I thought that was funny. But some people have taken it further. You can see if you place a traffic cone on mm -hmm. the hood, the sensors are unable to proceed. They, they know that something is wrong. Um, they don't like the traffic cone. They're scared of the traffic cone. And they just basically shut down and, and stay in one particular place, put their emergency flashers on. 
and um, they're stuck. So yeah. um, you can see a lot of people in San Francisco have begun just putting a uh, orange traffic cone on the, <laughs> there's two of them in a row, <laughs> uh, putting an orange traffic cone on these automated cars um, as a form of protest because, you know, they don't like them and they think that cars uh, maybe should have a driver that's able to react in them. Uh, I don't really have a comment either way on um, whether or not you should be doing this. I just think it's extremely funny. Yeah, I saw that. Um, I, I think earlier today I saw a story about that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I haven't been in San Francisco since RSA. Traffic was pretty bad. Maybe don't make it worse. I don't know. That's my <laughs> advice. For whatever you feel, like, let's try not to, you know, maybe make it worse. It's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I already shouted out this Meow Mixer board, mm. but I just want to say this was such a cool design and Angelina uh, did a really good job with this. Um, I think you, if you're coming to DEF CON, you'll probably see these around and they're a awesome soldering kit that I, uh, I think is just so cute. So, uh, yeah, just wanted to shout that out. Um, and let's go over to the bleeping computer news. Oh, well, actually I got coded in something and it's all French. Wonder what it is? What did France have to learn from me? Well, I was complaining about chat GPT, just like <laughs> I was at the start of this particular stream. So, okay, what is all this French? Whoa, I, my name is clearly in it. And they called me a white hat, which I really appreciate because that is stretching it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> gray hat, sure. White hat, sure. I, whatever, what, whatever you want to call me. So this is talking about chat GPT. Uh, je, je refuse. Um, and it's talking about how if you're using ChatGPT to make software, there are certain things built into it that are not useful. Ugh, this is so fine, fine. I'll just translate it. Thanks, Google. <laughs> um, so uh, what is cool about this article is kind of exploring why ChatGPT has restrictions built into it and how mm. those restrictions actually inhibit it from writing secure code. So one of the arguments I was making here is that um, ChatGPT has a lot of safeguards built in, one of them being like it, it isn't supposed to be able to like walk you through finding like a, a, a vulnerability that could be exploited right. or, you know, like like identifying a problem with the business and then letting you attack them. Like it, they've tried to defang it in a way where if you were to give it a piece of code and then ask it to discover vulnerabilities and it, it, pro it would probably refuse to do so. Yeah. Now, at the same time, it's perfectly happy to generate code, some of which is like hallucinated or uses imaginary, imaginary libraries. So if you have this thing that is willing to write code for you, but doesn't always write good, accurate, or right. uh, even like real code, uh, and then also have it preventing you from being able to audit its own code, you really end up with a circumstance where like this thing cannot correct itself um, right. because it might think that you're trying to, you know, exploit something or do something bad and it will block you from doing so. Um, yeah, it's, it's really not an ideal circumstance when you have um, like restrictions built into the AI, but then also yeah. it, it strays into this territory of making potentially insecure code. Um, anyway, it was kind of cool to be quoted in this article. Uh, and uh, I definitely don't recommend using chat GPT code <laughs> protection. Um, okay, speaking of France, uh, this was uh, probably one of the most interesting stories that I saw because I have no idea how this will be technically implemented. So France has passed a bill uh, allowing police to remotely activate cameras on citizens' cell phones. Let that sink in. <laughs> so um, the bill is apparently targeted um, towards people, you know, who are doing some sort of uh, offense. But um, mm -hmm. the idea would be that if police have a suspicion that like you are going to, you know, or are involved in some sort of crime, they can, uh, let's see, what is the specific wording of the bill? Um, they can activate, I think, the camera, the audio, and then maybe like GPS position as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was an amendment that was passed um, that makes it so you are required to get a like a warrant from a judge in order to do right. this. But I don't understand on a, on a technical capability, like how you would go about getting access to someone's phone to the point that you could do this, unless you just have like malware installed on every right. first citizen's phone and you can just turn it on arbitrarily, which seems like a, a hacker's dream yeah. to, to have like malware pre-installed and probably, you know, probably maybe not done correctly all of the time 
um, backdooring all of your citizens' phones to allow this mass surveillance seems like a pretty stupid idea, honestly. And I don't think many phone manufacturers are going to be interested in helping France develop a backdoor for their no. particular models. I know Apple has <laughs> refused to do that for the United yeah. States, um, but I don't know how like this would be enforced basically because mm -hmm. yeah like you can't just like snap your fingers and say i am the government like give me complete access to this person's cell phone like right. you can get access to like the data held by the carrier but like unless you're like pushing a malicious update or like you already have something installed on the phone it seems kind of um it seems kind of sketchy uh, yeah. so i guess i guess we'll see well, oh yes, then the other thing oh god james is gouging out the uh phone the camera in <laughs> Well, I was going to say the other thing too is like, okay, fine, they passed this law. Then, you know, you, it's in France. You pop over to Germany or any of the other countries that are immediately next door and just buy a phone there. <laughs> yeah. It really doesn't seem like the easiest thing to enforce without some right. sort of like draconian like procedure to make it so all phones are able to be subjected to this. So, yeah, I really don't understand how they are going to be rolling this out. Um, but, Wow. Yeah, it, it seems like a very sweeping and potentially very alarming law. All right. So this is an extension from what we were talking about last week. I believe this was Minnesota. Um, that this yes. Happened. Yeah. So this is uh, kind of the human impact of some of these ransomware attacks that we've been covering for the last several weeks. We were talking about the move it data transfer um, like attack and like how Clop ransomware has been going after a lot of these organizations that were found to be vulnerable to this. And both doing exploitation and ransomware. So in this case, um, the exploitation side of things is threatened to leak a bunch of super, super sensitive data that impacts lots of people um, and asking for a million dollars, basically, right. uh, in exchange for not doing this. Now, uh, just reading through this AP News story, I, like, and of course, I'm not a lawyer or whatever. I feel like the school is going to be on the hook for a lot more than a million dollars based yeah. on the kinds, the kinds of data that have been like released to the public. Like this is mm -hmm. stuff about like students' mental health, like like mm -hmm. legal proceedings, like all sorts of things that are highly sensitive to a lot of people. And worse, um, mo a lot of the time when companies or organizations are hit by a data breach, they're advised to be as opaque as possible. They're not supposed, mm -hmm. they don't want transparency. They don't right. want to be like disclosing the full scope of the breach. And that's often from a very defensive legal position. But mm -hmm. in this case, a lot of the parents here that are saying that their child's data has been involved are finding out about it when journalists reach out to yep. them. So like some of these journalists have gone through the data dumps and found like particularly like sensitive information that include like the full contact details of, right. you know, these parents and they've reached out to them and, and asked, Hey, like for one, like, has the school told you anything about this? And for two, yeah. like, did you know that like this information is now public now, obviously like, you know, there's like credit monitoring stuff and whatever else when it comes to all the financial harm that could come, but this goes way beyond financial harm. This is right. just straight up like trauma that they're inflicting on like students and, and faculty and a lot of other people included in this data breach because the kinds of files are not like business sensitive files. They're the kinds yeah. of files that are like incredibly like personally sensitive to lots of people. Um, and these could also compromise ongoing investigations and, and it's just a whole big mess of problems. Um, where schools have lots of sensitive data, they often don't have great controls or great security put into place. And when this happens, they often have very limited options for what they can do in response. But mm -hmm. one thing that's been the major complaint here is dragging their feet on notifying victims. Uh, it certainly is unfortunate that a lot of these parents have had to find out about this sort of thing from, um, yeah, from, from reporters rather than from the organization that is ultimately responsible for the data breach. Right. Yeah, I mean, this was like it, just reading it. It's sickening the the amount of you know these are people who already suffered potentially from incidents at school, and and now that it's going to haunt them forever. So I don't know. I don't have a strong recommendation technically, aside from if you're watching this and you're in the U.S., let's advocate to our representatives that we need comprehensive data security, you know, mandates at at a federal level. I mean, various states do, but. You know, we need our own GDPR. Um, we need some some strong guidance. Yeah, at, at this point, with ransomware and double exploitation becoming such profitable businesses, it, we're at the point where there's so much money in taking haphazardly 
handle data that's often like not necessary for any particular mm -hmm. thing. Like companies in the United States love to hoard data because they can't, yep. like there's no reason yeah. for them not to, it's profitable and like they can sell it and there's all sorts of reasons to hoard data. But because like there's no compelling reason for this data to exist sometimes, it, you know, it really makes people angry when all they get is free credit monitoring and their data has been breached for the fifth, sixth, seventh time mm -hmm. by some random company who faces virtually no consequences for hoarding and then losing this data. Yeah. <sighs> All right, moving on. Um, so this is a uh, critical bug uh, in Mastodon servers. And obviously, I was really pulling for Mastodon to do well as a kind of Twitter replacement or a place for security people to go. And mm -hmm. Twitter has made it as absolutely hard as possible to cross post on Mastodon or otherwise use it. So I found myself lacking on uh, keeping my Mastodon profile updated and, and being able to like cross post content, which sucks. But now there is another problem with Mastodon, and this is um, a a bug that lets attackers basically like bypass content sanitization and take yeah. over Mastodon servers. So this is tracked as 2023-36460 and is named Tor Roots. Um, so this also seems to be a pretty simple and straightforward attack. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's certainly something to keep an eye on if you use Mastodon or if you know anyone who administers a Mastodon server. Um, yeah, they're, the patches are server security updates, so need to be applied by administrators to remove the risk for their communities. Um, but it looks like it impacts all versions of Mastodon from 3.50 onwards. Um, yeah, um, and it looks like it was finally patched in 3.59, 4.05, and 4.13. The interesting thing is this, I mean, this is new for this platform, but this type of, um, this type of exploit is not new with, you know, I know Android had similar ones with zero click where you sent the media and the media processor handled it. So it's not something that's, um, it's not something that we shouldn't be wary of, you know, for any of these media processors. It's just, um, here we are yet again. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Um, that, that's pretty much <laughs> all defeat. I have to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so next up, we have some cybercrime news. This is an arrest in, uh, let's see, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. So the um, coast is, uh, um, and this was a pretty uh, notorious cybercrime group that went by a desktop group, Common Raven, and a couple other names. I believe we mentioned them before, and they're mostly focused on French language um, yeah. business email compromise campaigns. Um, they do some phishing, some malware, but really like a lot of this is just stealing money from businesses in the <laughs> easiest right. ways that they can. And a lot of this like BEC is gonna be like going through emails, waiting until your moment, and then sending uh, an email as somebody else within an organization yep. trying to either authorize like a fictitious payment or some, or maybe getting some sort of uh, detail or compliance they need in order to pull off a larger scheme. I know a university I, I used to go to was not breached by this group, but some other organization did a business yeah. email compromise scheme where they went into, they got into the university's email, they laid low until there was a huge construction project. And then when the contractor reached out with their uh, details, they deleted mm -hmm. the email and sent a new email from right. uh, like a phishing, uh, from like a phishing site with all fictitious uh, like details Yep. Um, followed up repeatedly to make sure the payment went through. And then the university found out that they'd actually paid some overseas account, um, like several yeah. million dollars. So these sorts of things hit all sorts of organizations and they can be extremely sneaky and clever when they strike. Yeah. Oh yeah. We've seen, I mean, this is, it's super common. And I mean, you know, this just goes to show that despite a lot of organizations having the security awareness training and stuff like that, we just have to be vigilant on it and you have to be, constantly suspicious i suppose it's not a good way to live but you know i'm i am constantly paranoid <laughs> yeah yeah and, and this group was pretty prolific and very successful um mm -hmm. as you can see they were able to like net 11 million dollars um in 35 attacks since 2018 so um seems like some arrests have now been made and that yeah. uh they may have had a stumble in their operation but it's still somewhat unlikely that the entire organization was wrapped up it seems like they're based in africa french speaking and they have plenty of victim companies to go after so while it seems like some arrests have been made it's probably not the last that we will see of this particular organization all right um this seems like too soon um, <laughs> Move yeah. transfer is warning customers of a new critical flaw. And this was an is an SQL uh, injection bug 
um, and two other less severe vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. um, so the SQL engine allows people to craft special queries to gain access to a database or tamper with it by executing code. Um, it does need to suffer from a lack of appropriate input output uh, data sanitization. So this isn't like as bad um, mm -hmm. as the the previous <laughs> breach that we've been talking about. It feels like for months mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, but uh, they have tracked it. They are now uh, pushing updates. And it is just a little scary for people that are still using this tool to you know, be told um, that there's yeah. another uh, vulnerability. But they have adopted uh, security service packs, which is like something that they're pushing out more often. Uh, they're trying to make it easier for people to update and continue to keep their their move it transfer um, like secure. But yeah, like I've just been I've just been seeing this in the news a lot lately. And anytime I see move it, I assume it's either a another data breach or mm -hmm. another vulnerability. So seeing another vulnerability is definitely not uh, not optimal. Yeah, I mean, you know. Software development is tough, but this just goes to reinforce you need good security practices throughout the entire development lifecycle. You, we can't get away with just bolting it on after the fact. And you know, for many years we kind of could, but with the way that everything is connected now, it's it's it has to be baked in. There's just no other way to do it. Yeah, <sighs> yeah, and. Um... <laughs> I guess this man was it only a month ago that this happened um, that like they were exploiting CVE twenty twenty three three four two six two. This is like the source of most of the yeah. exploitations we've been talking about over the last several weeks. So this was a mass exploited zero day vulnerability. Um, it, really, like the hackers probably have so much data they're they're struggling to go through it all and mm -hmm. uh, like appropriately you know exploit all these various businesses. But they've been extremely active in this, and uh, it has been a bad day. For people who were running an unpatched version of uh, this move it transfer tool all right next up uh so i am very suspicious of you know like sketchy third-party apps in the google yeah. Play Store because i just kind of assume that there's not a lot of oversight sometimes when it comes to right. sneaky updates or like extracting too much data like it really still is kind of the, the wild west it feels like when it comes to mm -hmm. some of these like um like apks you can install via the google play store and this is now another example of how sneaky actors can get into the Play Store, artificially inflate the popularity of an application, and then make off with a ton of user data. So in mm -hmm. this case, it looks like um, the the company or entity behind this is from China. They have been pushing these um, apps, which have a lot of installs. Like if you look and it has yeah. 1 million downloads or 800,000 uh, downloads, that's usually a, a 500,000 downloads. That's usually a pretty good sign that like a lot of people have tried this and like there's not a lot of complaints so far. Um, you know, it generally has decent ratings. Like it seems mm -hmm. like it's like a legitimate application. However, um, it seems as though it is hiding a service uh, that allows, oh yeah, and it insists that there's no data. <laughs> so that's like really the data collection declaration mm -hmm. on Google Play. Um, but this declaration doesn't necessarily get like updated if the behavior right. of the software um, were to change. And in this case, um, it was discovered that uh, it was exfiltrating users' contact lists from on-device memory, connected email accounts and social networks, pictures, audio, and video that are managed or recovered from within the applications, real-time user location, so it's acting like a tracking device, yeah. mobile country code, mobile provider name, network code of the SIM provider, operating system vendor number, and device brand and model. So being able to tie a particular device vendor, all this other information, along with like GPS data, and your contact list is a pretty extensive, yeah, pretty extensive profile on you. Again, it's not really known if this is being used for espionage, advertising, or what, but it's certainly a lot more information than these applications require. And they went through a good amount of effort to hide the fact that they were collecting this data. So uh, there are some ways of going through and trying to like you know like look at what all these packages are doing and and examining them. Um, I've seen a couple like. Um, I think Nick did some examples of like uh, like reverse engineering APKs and seeing exactly mm -hmm. what they do before installing them. Um, but it's it's not always easy for the average person to detect whether or not there's some hidden component or some right. other you know like thing that's going on below the surface from some of these apps that are coming from a legitimate place. Yeah. Um, Oh, it looks like they've finally been removed. So as of the writing of this article, um, these had been discovered to be potentially malicious and were still up on the Google Play Store. But since then, the apps have been removed from Google Play. Um, Google Play Protect protects users from apps known to contain this malware on Android devices with Google Play services. 
um, even when it comes from places outside the Play Store. Okay, then how did these million people manage to get into <laughs> Google? I don't know. All right. So either way, be very, very careful when installing unknown applications onto your device. Just because it has a million downloads and a, a decent um, rating does not mean it's necessarily safe. And as I say this, I'm going to go and uninstall um, a couple apps. <laughs> Um, just a slightly off topic. I got a new watch yesterday after having the same watch for like literally seven, six or seven years. And it has Bluetooth built in, which I don't particularly mm. like, and I'm currently tracking it, um, all right. over the place. And I just want to see like how easy it would be to like track someone from the Bluetooth on their watch. There is the ability to turn it off, but I'm going to also be exploring whether or not, um, it actually turns off when you say it turns off. Yeah. But really the worst part of the whole process is that, um, the watch company has like four mobile applications, one of which has wonderful reviews and the others have terrible reviews. And when you <laughs> install the one with wonderful reviews, it immediately tells you that it's becoming deprecated and you'll need uh -huh. to switch over to one of the ones with one or two right. stars. So like sometimes like even the mobile applications that are put out by like reputable companies are so sketchy and have such terrible reviews that they look way more dangerous to install than yeah. any of these applications. So for people who are like, you know, just, you know, buying products and like trying to use them using uh, like apps that are provided by legitimate companies, like it's probably going to be really confusing what is malware and what is legitimate because the Casio watch app looks a lot lo more like right. a malicious <laughs> app than this one does. And it actually clearly states that it exfiltrates tons of data. So at least they're yeah. upfront about all the data that they're taking, but it, it's still pretty confusing for users to know what is a legitimate company taking way too much data just because they feel like it. And what is, you know, like a, a third party application that's maybe, you know, saying that they're not taking data, but is actually taking even more than uh, some of these other, I don't know. It, it's just a very confusing environment for people that are trying to use products, deal with companies with shoddy apps, and then, mm -hmm. you know, get presented with what looks like a legitimate application, but is actually even more malicious. Yeah, I, I gave up on smartwatches long ago because I've never had a great experience. I had, I mean, I don't know if you remember this, I had a Pebble, like back when that, like the, the you know, V1 smartwatch. And then they're like, ah, oh, we don't support it anymore. And then it was gone. And I had another one. I just gave up. I wanted to tell I, time. It has my mine's mechanical now. It has gears and springs, which you can't really hack, hack on that. With <laughs> maybe, maybe you could hack it with some sand, but aside from right. that, you know, you know <laughs> I uh, I have had like a like a G Shock watch for like a long mm -hmm. time, and I, I basically just yeah. want to see if it, if it would be mm -hmm. useful to get like notifications and stuff. Um, and also you can turn it off, so it'll still last for about right. two years. And that's my thing. I never want to charge a watch. I think that I yeah. have enough things I forget to charge. My phone's on like ten percent battery most of the day sometimes. So um, yeah, like the the fact that Bluetooth is creeping into even like traditional things like like watches um, mm -hmm. that don't need to be charged for like years at a time is pretty crazy. The fact that they they just made like a tile tracker or like an air tag basically built into a watch. The right. only thing that I like about it is that I can uh, it has a find my phone feature where you could like press the button and it like makes your phone flip out like all loud. But yeah. it exfiltrates a ton of data and it can probably allow you to be tracked pretty much arbitrarily. Yeah because I seriously doubt that it randomizes its Bluetooth address, but we'll see. I'm going to be doing some experiments on this. I wouldn't even call it a smartwatch. It's just like a Bluetooth connected regular watch that like does push right, notifications okay. sometimes. But it's like, it, it's one of these weird hybrid spaces where like, if you looked at it, you wouldn't expect it to be a smartwatch. Yeah. It's just, it just looks like a regular watch. It doesn't need to be charged, but you know, we'll see. Kind of a, kind of a, a strange technology, honestly, to mm -hmm. take a regular watch and then just give it like a tiny bit of Bluetooth and then end up <laughs> making a tracker of yourself. Ah, the NSA has a fine Cody Spun <laughs> feature too. Oh, that's nice. Now we both do. <laughs> All right. So um, there has been a breach of Nickelodeon, which has been confirmed by the company. And apparently, and this is um, mostly from what I've heard on Twitter, uh, they are being very, very uh, he heavy handed when it comes to, um, it comes to like takedown requests or like anybody mm -hmm. linking to, discussing, sharing, talking about the contents of like anything about this data breach has been uh, contacted by lawyers yeah. and told to stop doing that or had their stuff taken down. Um, but this is apparently a, a breach of mostly production files. So it's stuff that isn't like the the, the employee files right. of people who work there or like the sensitive details of like child actors. Like, no, this appears to be like animation files and other things, but it is 500 gigabytes of documents wow. and media files. Although if it was all media files, then maybe it's not, maybe it's not that much. Yeah, it's not that but, much. <laughs> But yeah, there's lots of stuff that is being published here. Um, it seems as though 
again, this is relatively like old data, but it was leaked mm -hmm. on a Discord server and being reposted all over the place. So you'll probably see more stories about this. Yeah. Um, but it seems like the data is relatively like benign. Like they're they're clearly taking issue with like, you know, like their intellectual property being shared, but it doesn't at this time anyway, seem to be any like sensitive business or personal data from their employees. So it seems like nobody's getting free credit monitoring in this case, which is uh, kind of remarkable, honestly. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if uh, we'll finally learn what the Nickelodeon slime was. Maybe that shows my age. Do they still do that anymore? <laughs> I think that they do. And if they don't, they absolutely should because that was like canon Nickelodeon. Yeah. Or let's bring back Double Dare. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to spin this into a positive. Let's get, you know, maybe someone will see some of these old clips and, you know, get nostalgic and uh, they'll remake it. Yeah. Yeah. Some child slide down, actor, slide, you know. Some former child actor will get a renewal. <laughs> All right, so um, this is a, a kind of a technically interesting uh, attack. Yeah. So this, I don't believe that they found any exploitation of this, but Cisco was warning that it's possible to uh, read uh, uh, encrypted data mm -hmm. or possibly even modify it um, but that's being exchanged between sites. So this is networking hardware that's supposed to connect different sites together. It's a kind of like almost like interstitiary networking equipment that's supposed to um, allow like data centers and other things to work together. But uh, it is obviously like a pretty big deal if you're able to like take a man in the middle position when you're this right. kind of device. If you're able to decrypt traffic and potentially modify it, then it means you know two data centers talking to each other can't necessarily trust mm -hmm. what is being exchanged because it might actually have been compromised. And of course, like encrypting the data in the first point probably means that it's right. sensitive or needs not to be modified. So this could be a potentially severe vulnerability allowing attackers to do whatever they want um, with the data that's flowing uh, through this device. So it seems like it has not been actively exploited, but it exploited, but is it is still worth noting that it's out there. So anybody running this sort of equipment should definitely update uh, or that they are not potentially exposing data flowing through their equipment. All right, next up we have, um, I'm not sure if this is bad or not, but yeah. over 130,000 solar energy monitoring systems are exposed online. And at the moment, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're vulnerable or that there's anything wrong. Right. It just means that they're up there. Anybody can scan them and find them. And if anything were to go wrong, it certainly would be super easy for someone to write a script to access all of them at right. the same time. So Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know oh, what you'd get or what you'd want to do with it. I mean, aside from like disruption, I guess, of the, the power generation, but probably still shouldn't be up there. I don't know. Yeah, it, it mostly seems to be a concern that like being able to like access this sort of thing currently isn't an issue, mm -hmm. but it could leak sensitive right. data. Uh, in particular, some of the settings of these were able to be accessed and maybe you could pull down some information about like the configuration, the network yeah. it's connected to, and, like some other stuff. Um, but ultimately, yes, the big concern here is having all this stuff just publicly accessible, easy to scan, easy to find means that if there's ever a vulnerability discovered on like the web interfaces or anything else of these, it would be very, very, very easy for people to go through, automatically target them and mm -hmm. potentially either damage or, you know, like uh, install botnets on tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, solar energy systems. So mm -hmm. if you had a botnet that was just tied, tied to a bunch of solar panels, uh, it is going to be a pain to go through yeah. and, you know, clean those out, especially at this sort of scale. And this is exactly the sort of thing that causes botnets to happen in the first place. When you have like 130,000 of anything exposed online, right. it certainly makes it a tempting target for takeover. And at that point, you can do anything from like routing malicious traffic, places that it's not supposed to go, or you could do things like a denial of service attack by having all of these solar energy monitoring systems suddenly mm -hmm. start sending traffic to a single server. Um, hey, before we move on to the next story, oh yeah, I was just gonna say, we should, we should uh, answer Kevin's question. Yeah, we should. So one thing that I would say for a Mac OS computer is um, Patrick Wardle makes a number of really good tools that do this. And one of them is Lulu. Um, so it acts like if you're familiar with Little Snitch, it acts in a way where it gets between a program that's attempting to, to connect to the internet and asks you if you want to allow it. And then if you want to set a rule based on that application. So that means that certain applications are just not allowed to connect to the internet. And when I see things attempting to establish connections, I always get a choice to not to disallow it or uh, you know otherwise get in the way of it. Uh, it's gotten pretty good with not getting all up in your face and asking for notifications constantly. So if you use a Mac OS computer, I would highly recommend um, Lulu is what I use and I like it a lot. 
if you're in the Windows world, I know Microsoft, for as much as you trust them, I won't say anymore. Um, <laughs> the, the Defender Firewall has gotten better. I believe you can do app control, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. I can't check on the machine that I'm on right now. Um, but uh, but there are certainly options for it, absolutely. Yeah, so here's my pick. If you're on Mac OS, Lulu, I, I already did, Patrick. I already do. Um, Lulu <laughs> is a great way of being able to see like what's going on. When it pops up, it looks like this. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see where it's trying to connect to. Um, you can see its ancestry. So you can quickly see like what application or what process like launched this whole thing. And you can also send the process that's requesting it to VirusTotal. What's great about that oh, is nice. like, you literally click on this tool and it'll give you an assessment of like whether or not any antiviruses think that this behavior is like malicious or if this file has been reported before. So if you were to get a malicious file or, or, or something mm -hmm. attempting to establish a C2 server, you would not only get an alert, but you would get an opportunity to potentially discover the malicious file um, just by using this pop-up. So I love Lulu. I think it's wonderful. And if you are on Mac OS, um, this is my go-to. Uh, James uh, brought in some clarification too. Is there anything on Android or um, I guess uh, Apple that you would recommend um, iOS devices, I should say? I don't know off the top of my head on Android. Um, I know Cody, you're an Android user too. Is there anything that you use? No, unfortunately, I don't have anything equivalent to. Um, I don't have anything equivalent to that. If I want to find out like what my phone is calling home to, I do. I do something dumb and like have it connect to like an open network and then you know like filter through all the DNS requests and like try to like yeah. tally up like exactly what it's resolving, um, which is weird. There's a Facebook tracks everything, <laughs> but um, but yeah, like it, it is a lot harder to do that on um, Android, at least that I've seen. So if anybody has any good recommendations for Android firewalls, um, I'm interested. Like I I love Lulu and I think it's a great way of being able to detect a potentially malicious script early on, doing something it has mm -hmm. to do in order to survive. So that's kind of the, the focus of a lot of Patrick's tools are like, rather than try to detect the malware specifically, you just detect the kinds of behavior that all malware right. needs to do in order to live. So um, yeah, this is an example of how you can catch them, try to communicate. But there's also things like every time Adobe tries to run an update and then encrypts a bunch of files, I get an alert that a particular process is encrypting too many files and it allows me to terminate it if I want. Kind of a nice thing if you're uh, undergoing a ransomware attack to get an alert and be able to shut it down before it's able to encrypt too much stuff. So there's lots of great stuff out there. All right, um, so this is uh, a vulnerability in the Linux kernel that is called stack rot. Um, this is something that seems pretty serious, although there <laughs> are a lot of caveats here uh, for what has to happen um, in order to cause this vulnerability. Um, so, all right, so here, here are some details. Um, so this is a weak spot. It's called the maple tree data structure, um, which was introduced in Linux kernel 6.1. Um, and this is, I believe, like a yes, a use after free, which we mm. see a lot. And this was actually made the list of like, you know, like yeah, incredibly common bugs that need to be fixed uh, that we were going through. I think last week or the week before. Um, and this is yeah, something that's going to affect multiple versions of Linux. It seems as though people are pretty convinced that an exploit is coming. Um, and since uh, you know the details of this have now been released, it's going to be on anybody who's running an affected Linux server to update it before um, before <laughs> this exploit comes out. So the researcher announced that they're going to disclose the complete technical details and a proof of concept by the end of July. So there's definitely mm. a ticking clock on this. Yep. So um, if, if you run a Linux server uh, and you need to do some updating, make sure to do it before the end of July, which is when anyone is going to be able to use this proof of concept to potentially exploit the vulnerability. All right, moving along. I think we've got like five minutes. So yeah, <laughs> uh, this is a so we I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, which was a team Fisher, uh, Microsoft Teams Fisher vulnerability that allowed you to send users files even from outside the organization. Mm -hmm. So what this looks like is you know you'll, you're going about your work day and you get a Microsoft Teams message um, that appears to be from within your organization and it has some relevant file attached. If you were to open that file, then you know you would be infected. And this is a, a way that you know you could get through an otherwise like relatively secure organizations um, like defenses and be able to present a malicious file in a trusted context to a user who might be distracted or even expecting a file like that. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, apparently somebody uh, on the US Navy red team um, made this tool that automates 
um, the process <laughs> and makes it so that you can find different users who are vulnerable to it, confirm your ability to send them files, and then uh, automatically send uh, the attachment to the user SharePoint, um, which is really cool. Uh, I think that yeah. it's interesting to see this go from like a just kind of a, a thing that you could do to now a proof of concept that automates the, the entire process and makes it so if you're testing this on your own organization, you can immediately see who is vulnerable and what the extent of it is. Um, the fix here is also pretty straightforward, um, making sure that you're disabling um, outside individuals from sending messages to people within your organization. Um, uh, yes, communications with external tenants if not needed. Uh, and then if you absolutely have to do that, creating an, an allow list with trusted domains um, would limit the risk of exploitation here. But uh, yeah, this is um, also something that's not going to be fixed uh, in the near future. Uh, Microsoft has sent a report saying, we're aware of this report and determined that it relies on social engineering to be successful. We encourage customers to not fall for social engineering. Um, I I find this response lacking for, <laughs> for Microsoft, I mean, Teams and, and all of Microsoft platform the three the whole 365 environment it's it's a collaborative platform uh you know and it's designed exactly for for that type of stuff and how many i mean three quarters of the things that we talk about have some type of social engineering and trying to downplay it i feel like is i don't know i i yeah. I, I didn't i didn't i don't think this comes across great i mean no. personally i don't i don't really like it either yeah. no uh, all right, so this is probably the biggest story this week. Uh, Jap mm -hmm. Japan's largest port has completely stopped operations after a ransomware attack. Um, this port accounts for 10% of Japan's total trade volume. Operates 21 piers, 290 berths, handles 2 million containers, and a cargo tonnage of 165 million every year. So it's also the largest port by used by the Toyota Motor Corporation. So in so far is like the prime target for a ransomware mm -hmm. operation this is what ransomware operators are looking for yeah. a system that's easy to encrypt has an incredibly high damage potential and causes unfathomable losses for every day that it is locked down um if this port does not have backups they are going to be losing like billions of dollars yeah. um not just for them but also for organizations that are relying on this sort of trade at 10% of a country's total trade, this port like basically is essential. And like, yeah. I get the feeling that they're going to pay whatever it costs to get this fixed and back up and running. It looks like this happened originally on the sixth. So what is that yesterday? Yes. So obviously this has just happened. I would assume that like based on the amount of money that this port is going to be losing, like, uh, like I can't see how they unless they have backup systems, I can't see yeah. how they wouldn't pay the ransom just because it's going to be so incredibly expensive and so many businesses and probably even like government organizations are going to start immediately suffering losses from this that like, it, it just seems like exactly, exactly the yeah. kind of thing that a, a ransomware operator would be targeting because it's almost a guaranteed payday. Yeah, I think I read this last night and, and I believe they claim that as of 8.30 their time, it should have been back up, but I didn't see a follow up if they actually got operations going again. Um, but if your GR Corolla is delayed, blame <laughs> blame these attackers. Yeah, abs absolutely crazy to see. Like, imagine like if this hit like the port of Long Beach, right? Or yeah, something. like you know, like with like missiles would be fired against someone. You know, like just because like it's it's critical infrastructure. Yep. It like it affects national security. It affects like private businesses. Mm -hmm. It affects everything. It's just totally critical infrastructure. So seeing a, a huge port like this get hit is definitely a little jarring because you can imagine it happening, you know, here in the United States mm -hmm. and what the response would be. This, Again, yeah. probably missiles. Yeah, I was gonna say this, this could almost be as big as, you know, like, like some of the pipeline or some of the, you know, the critical infrastructure, because it's critical infrastructure. This is the type of attention that I would almost imagine whoever did this might want to walk away from if they were yeah. smart, you know? Um, yeah, if this is a low level ransomware affiliate um, and it's not like a major ransomware gang like Klopp or something, um, they pro it's probably too hot for them. You know, if this right. is just some guy who's buying, you know, paying an affiliate fee and then like, mm -hmm. you know, getting malware that he doesn't barely even knows how to operate and just happens to have hit this organization because they were vulnerable. I mean, we saw in the case of like San Francisco public transportation, some, yeah. like, a ransomware affiliate was just like, I don't want this. This is too yep. much. I'm stressed out and I don't want it. And they walked away yeah. from the entire thing, which actually made things worse because then even if the city wanted to pay them, they still couldn't get their stuff fixed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, 
kind of scary. All right. Um, so we talked about manifest confusion last time in NPM packages. So this is something where sometimes the JSON manifest and like the other requirements wouldn't match uh, when you're attempting to install something. And that could cause uh, attackers to be able to uh, put in like a malicious repository instead if the JSON manifest hasn't been updated. Um, so this is, uh, this is something of, I would say moderate, uh, moderate severity. If you're using a lot of NPM packages, this, this mostly applies to you, but because so many things do automatically pull updates and stuff from NPM, this is something that could cause a lot of issues. Uh, so this tool is something that allows you to look for confusion. So it checks really quickly to see whether or not the manifest and the JSON make sense and are the same. And if they're not, it will point out some sort of confusion. Um, so you can see no mismatch detected color. Um, like, kind of just checking to see if a particular package contains anything that might look suspicious. So kind of cool to see such a quick follow-up on, you know, last week we were talking about how this was an issue and now there's a tool to check to see if there's this issue. If you're a heavy user of, N of NPM, you might want to run this before installing packages for the first time just to make sure that this sort of attack isn't possible. All right, we've got a couple more good ones. So this one, pretty run of the mill, Chinese espionage yeah. targeting European uh, organizations. Um, this has a lot of commonality with other Chinese threat actors, and it's mostly um, mostly phishing. So they're sending yeah. documents that are typically themed around European domestic and, and foreign policies. So this is like you know, the kind of stuff that you would expect like diplomats or other people to be interested in. And you can see they're particularly interested in Ukraine, <laughs> uh, these kind of countries close right. to Ukraine, and then other Western allies. Um, so the, the phishing details include a letter from the Serbian embassy, a document stating the priorities of the Swedish presidency of the Council of the European Union, an invitation to a diplomatic conference in Hungary, and an article about two human rights lawyers. <laughs> That's a little close to home, you guys think? But all right. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is a, an ongoing espionage campaign that seems to show that China is a lot more interested in what's going on in Europe since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. So um, again, kind of run in the mill. This is a, what we've seen from Chinese threat actors for a mm -hmm. good amount of time now, but just a new attack um, with kind of rather traditional techniques. Yep. Okay. And this is my favorite piece of news. So I teach people about Wi-Fi all the time. And there are a number of things that make it really difficult to trust an open Wi-Fi network. The number one thing is that your phone does not save any information about the network that it has connected to. So let's say that you go to McDonald's and you connect to McDonald's Wi-Fi. I, as an attacker, could you know go close to your house and create a McDonald's Wi-Fi network and your phone would be like, sweet, I'm at McDonald's. And it would automatically <laughs> connect to this network and allow me to start potentially manipulating your data traffic. So in order to get around this, um, it's useful to collect more information on the wireless networks that you that you are joining if you you know trust them. And this is a tool that does just that. So what I like about this tool is that it will record information like a MAC address and like mm -hmm. other information from the beacon management frames of a particular network. Um, and this is going to be things like the vendor, the BSS ID, supported rates, channel country, max transmit tower, and other things. Um, that are going to vary between access points, but will be consistent for a specific one over a period of time. Obviously, the vendor is not going to change. The BSS ID right. probably won't change. And then the supported capabilities of the device probably won't change as well. Now, that might not necessarily be true. As a Wi-Fi person, I can say there's actually a number of, of things that would cause this tool to go absolutely haywire. Let me explain two of them. So one of them is if you update uh, or you know just get a new router, um, the supported rates, channel, uh, whatever else, and max transfer power, power might actually change. Now, the country probably isn't going to change, but the supported mm -hmm. rates may change. For example, if you were to get an update that enabled WPA3. So while I like this idea, um, it you know a, an equipment change would definitely cause some sort of alarm on this. And the second is going to be something called extended service sets. So when you so when you have a Wi-Fi a Wi-Fi network, you are also going to have a bunch of extenders in some places like schools or other organizations that have to have lots of access points over a large distance. Now, these um, extenders will have the same uh, network name and the same characteristics as any other part of the network. Like, for example, if uh, I wanted to go to the like, community college Wi-Fi, I could go anywhere on that community college campus and be connected to 
community college Wi-Fi, but I'm going to be connected to different access points as I roam around campus. That's just the way that these are set up to work. Now, right. every one of these access points is going to have a different MAC address. It might even have a different vendor ID. Uh, it might have different transmit power. It might have different supported rates. Um, so this tool is going to go off like crazy every time you go to mm -hmm. a place that uses extended service sets. So I really like this idea. People are shocked when I tell them that their phone doesn't save any information about the access points that they connect to, except for the type of security and the password and mm -hmm. the and the SSID. That is it. So because of extended service sets, it's really not useful for your phone to constantly be triggering and saying, oh, no. The, the access point you're connected to has a different MAC address and different right. whatever, because that's going to happen constantly for a mm -hmm. lot of people who are connecting to open Wi-Fi networks. So I really like the idea behind this tool. I do think there are going to be a relatively high amount of false positives. But hey, if you're going to be connecting to, you know, like a, a consistent open wireless network over time, mm -hmm. this is a good idea. I just think that if you're going to a hotel and like all of a sudden this thing starts going off and like, oh, you're connecting to a different network, even though it has the same name, it's like, Obviously, yeah, yeah. It's an extended service set. The hotel has like probably potentially up to like hundreds of access points spread out around um, that have different characteristics. So while this tool is a really good idea, I think it's going to make some people really super paranoid because they might not adequately explain what an extended service right. set looks like versus like somebody phishing. And I can't see any details in this tool that would um, that would like help a user differentiate between positive. So I'm tempering my enthusiasm a little bit with like the knowledge that yes, this could cause false positives. Um, one thing that this is also good at is being able to detect um, access points created by Airbase NG. Now, obviously, if somebody's creating an access point via Airbase NG, you probably want to know about it because it means someone is using a Linux tool to make an access point um, in a very non-standard way. So you're not connecting to a router, you're connecting mm -hmm. to someone's like Kali Linux instance. Obviously, that is useful. But the mechanism uh, here that's used to authenticate um, access points is going to be like a SHA-256 hash of the wireless access point details. Seems like a pretty easy way of doing that. But again, like yeah. an update or an extended service set could totally mess up this theory. I still really like it though. So as a tool that I think makes security a little bit better and addresses some of the shortcomings with Wi-Fi, I think this is cool. And um, I'm for all for all of the, the edge cases I pointed out, I still right. think it will be a relatively useful people who are worried about Wi-Fi security. And I think it said it was free on GitHub, so try it out. Yeah, definitely. I and I, I probably will. I want to see if, um, some of these spoof networks are able to be caught mm -hmm. by it and exactly what mechanism it uses. I also like you know like a sophisticated attack probably like read these beacon frames and then just retransmit them. Like packets are. Mm -hmm. We right. got scapey, you know, it's like packets are pretty easy to just like build from scratch or from a template. So while I think that this tool is great against traditional like aircrack NG or airbase NG, like based like uh, attacks against a wireless network or spoofing of a wireless network, I, I think there's definitely some right. ways of getting around this if you're a more sophisticated attacker. But the average person isn't going to be running this and most phones and uh, laptops are pretty dumb when it comes to what access right. point they're joining. So we will continue to see how this works out in the cat and mouse game between Wi-Fi hackers <laughs> and Wi-Fi defenders. OK, I think that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thanks for our audience for being patient with us. I think the live chat went out like three separate times. Like Restream just updated, and all the controls are in a different place, and like some stuff not working. <laughs> but a uh, lot of news that we went through. Um, so yeah, I guess like I. Just another reminder, I won't be here next week, so don't be confused when we're not doing the Wednesday <laughs> stream. I'm going to be doing that cyber camp. And if you have any questions about any of the stories we went on over went over today, I want to remind everyone of the Discord server. It's nugget.lol. I'll drop it in the chat again right now. Nugget.lol. We've had a lot of people post great questions um, and other news stories that we've ended up covering. So if you're in our Discord server already, just want to give you guys a shout out and a thank you. Ah, yes, Snappy. See, the news actually came from our server. Um, we'd love to see you there. And also, if you have questions, you can drop them on the YouTube channel where we will answer them every Wednesday except the upcoming Wednesday. So I guess the Wednesday <laughs> after that. But oftentimes, if you ask the same question in our live chat, um, a lot of people just jump in and answer. And we have a lot of very talented and very experienced people in our server. So yeah, hopefully you can get your questions answered either way. Per always, I want to give a big shout out to Veronas for letting us do the show. Uh, Killian is wonderful to have on. And both of us working on this is only possible through uh, Verona supporting mm -hmm. us. So if you want to show your support for the stream, you can you can go to veronas.com slash Cody. That's K-O-D-Y. They do check to see how many people are following up on that like every week. Uh, and it's just a little way you can support the show and let us know you care. 
All right. So we will see you guys not next week, but the week after. Killian, thanks for coming on. And uh, we'll see you next time, everyone. Bye. Take care.